All right. Uh, so far, we covered every uh, technological aspect of blockchain. We covered every cryptographic background. So now it is time to have a general overview of the blockchain technology. So this week, we will talk uh, generally about blockchain. And in the following weeks, uh, we will cover cryptocurrencies, but mostly focusing on Bitcoin and Ethereum. So today's lecture will be about blockchain technology. And actually, I'm uh, adapting most of my slides today from NIST internal report 8202, Blockchain Technology Overview, which I believe is a very good overview. So I recommend you all of you to read it. So most of the slides are actually from this document. So let's start. Blockchains are tamper evident and tamper resistant digital ledgers implemented in a distributed fashion and usually without a central authority. So actually, it looks like a, like a very simple sentence, but actually it has a lot and it actually mentions a lot of misconceptions because everybody talk about blockchains and they say that it is immutable or tamper proof. But here we are not saying that, but instead we are saying tamper evident and tamper resistant. So tamper resistance means resistant mean that, means that it is hard to tamper a blockchain, but it is still possible. Okay, it is not impossible. So that is the main point. Also, it is tamper evident. So we don't say that nobody can change it. We say that it can be changed, but we will notice that it has changed. So this is why we call it a tamper evident. And most of the time we don't uh, require a central authority. This is valid for cryptocurrencies, but for uh, other uh, blockchains, so sometimes you can have central authority. So we will mention this when we talk about permission and permissionless blockchains. And the important thing is that we, we are actually keeping a digital ledger, okay? We are storing everything, every transaction in these ledgers. So they enable a community of users to record transactions in a shared ledger. No transaction can be changed once published. This is important. In 2008, the blockchain idea was combined with several other technologies to create modern cryptocurrencies. The first such blockchain-based cryptocurrency was Bitcoin. So we already mentioned this. So let's focus on Bitcoin just a little bit to see how a blockchain ID is used in the Bitcoin. Within the Bitcoin blockchain, information representing electronic cash is attached to a digital address. So we already seen that this digital address is actually a, a hash of a, a point on an elliptic curve, right? Bitcoin users can digitally sign and transfer rights to that information to another user. And the Bitcoin blockchain records this transfer publicly, allowing all participants of the network to independently verify the validity of the transactions. So we already seen elliptic curve digital signature and Schnorr signatures. So we, in Bitcoin, we use as follows. We digitally sign a transaction. So this actually transfer the rights of some cryptocurrency from you to somebody else, which you are transferring money to. The Bitcoin blockchain is stored, maintained, and collect collaboratively managed by a distributed group of participants. This, along with certain cryptographic mechanisms, makes the blockchain resilient to attempts to alter the ledger later. So this is the whole idea behind the Bitcoin. So let's uh, talk about blockchains in general. Blockchain is hype, but the technology is not well understood. So actually this NIST document is probably a few years old, but this sentence is still valid, right? Bitcoin was around in 2009 and 13 years passed and still nobody actually really understood what a blockchain is. So this is one of the huge problems. So it's still a hype, people trying to earn money, but the idea of the blockchain actually still not well understood. So we have to understand uh, some things. First, uh, first of all, it is not magical. It will not solve all problems. This is very important because you can search the internet, you can search academic papers, and you will realize that the, they use blockchain idea to everything and expect to solve all of those problems. But actually, 
unfortunately, most of them are wrong or not necessary. Okay, so it cannot solve all your problems. There is a tendency to want to apply it to every sector in every way imaginable, which is another problem. The use of blockchain technology is not a silver bullet, and there are issues that must be considered, such as how to deal with malicious users, how controls are applied, and the limitations of the implementation. So these things that NIST suggests to be considered are never considered in academic papers, unfortunately. So instead of how can we make our problem fit into the blockchain technology paradigm, the mindset should be how could blockchain technology potentially benefit us? So this is very, very important. Since 2012, many companies consulted me about blockchain and they told me that they want to use the blockchain technology in their company. And I asked why. And they said that the blockchain is a hype. They don't know what it is, but everybody's talking about it. So this is why they want to use it. So they are honest, at least. And I uh, tried to explain how the blockchain idea works, and I explained how they can use it. And at the end, they realized that they don't need it. So this is a very, very important problem, which is still valid. I still uh, receive emails or phone calls from many companies, and they are saying that they are going to use the blockchain technology to store this kind of data and I explained that why this is a bad idea. And most of the time I convinced them. So organizations should treat blockchain technology like they would any other technological solution at their disposal and use it in appropriate situations. So this is very important. So many topics became hype in the past, like, you know, they're still hype actually, like topics like machine learning, Internet of Things, Big Data, Cloud, these are very nice words, buzzwords actually. So people are very happy to use them, but they use it most of the time in inappropriate situations. For instance, many companies keep their company secrets in the cloud as plain text. And this is actually not something we can accept, right? So, you know, but people still do it. So this is why uh, blockchain technology is somewhat similar. You have to be careful about where to use it and why to use it, okay? So you should know the idea behind it. You should know the limitations and you should not know how to control it and so on. So organizations must understand that while changes to the actual blockchain data may be difficult, applications using the blockchain as a data layer work around this by treating later blocks and transactions as updates or modifications to earlier blocks and transactions. So that was the idea. So I told that no transaction can be changed. So once you send uh, Bitcoin to somebody, actually the transaction stays there. But you, the, that person creates another transaction and transfer the rights of that Bitcoin to somebody else, so it appears as a, another transaction. By looking all of these transactions in the blockchain, we can actually update our wallets and uh, then determine which Bitcoin belongs to who. So you cannot actually modify once something is written, but you create new transactions so that by looking at them, we somehow modify it. Think them they are modified. Another critical aspect of blockchain technology is how the participants agree that the transaction is valid. This is called reaching consensus, and there are many models for doing so, each with positives and negatives for particular business cases. So in the third part of this talk, I will briefly mention most of the famous consensus models. But uh, before designing a blockchain, you have to actually uh, carefully state the problem so that you can choose which consensus model is appropriate for you, okay? Blockchain implementations are often designed with a specific purpose or function, like Bitcoin, you have a very specific purpose. So you just transfer uh, digital assets to each other. Example functions include cryptocurrencies, smart contracts, which are actually software deployed on the blockchain and executed by the computers running that blockchain or distributed ledger systems between businesses and so on. So 
you can use blockchains for many different purposes. There are two general high level categories, permissionless and permissioned. So this is really important because people don't know that they are permissioned blockchain. Everybody think about Bitcoin, which is permissionless. So people think that everything is permissionless, but there are different blockchains. In a permissionless blockchain network, anyone can read and write to the blockchain without authorization. Permission blockchain networks limit parts participation to specific people or organizations and allow finer grain controls. So let's look these two uh, technology in a closer way. So blockchains are distributed ledger comprised of blocks. Each block is comprised of a block content header containing metadata about the block and block data containing a set of transactions and related data. So I, I will come back to permission and permissionless models in the future. So let's currently keep it like that. So think about Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency. They are permissionless because in those cryptocurrencies, so you can be a part of the network, you can join at any time, you can do mining and you know you can create blocks and so on. So it is permissionless. So actually this is why we don't know anybody, but we have to somehow uh, trust that system works. We will talk about it, but as long as you know, more than half of the uh, participants are honest and it should work correctly. But you can have permission blockchains. Uh, here, there might be some authorities who give uh, authorization to some people or organizations so that they can join the network. So let's focus on the blockchains and actually part of the blocks. Blockchains are distributed ledger comprised of blocks. Each block is comprised of a block header containing metadata about the block and the block data containing a set of transactions and related data. Every block, except for the first block of the blockchain, which is generally called uh, the Genesis block, contains a cryptographic link to the previous block's header. Actually, we, by cryptographing link, we are actually talking about the hash, right? So we are actually hashing block header, not the whole block, but the block header, we will see uh, more clearly in the following slides. But instead of saying, you know, block one, block two, and block three, we actually also keep the uh, hash of the previous block so that whenever we say that which block we are talking about, we can be sure that it is coming from the previous block. So this way you provide actually temper resistance. Each transaction involves one or more blockchain network users and a recording of what happened and it is digitally signed by the user who submitted the transaction. So uh, it doesn't matter who you are sending money to or any, you are transferring any rights to somebody, that somebody actually doesn't have to be included in this process. They don't even need to be connected to the network at that time. You are sending the money, the Bitcoin, or you are transferring the right or something. So you are the one who is signing the transaction. You simply provide the public key of the person you are uh, transferring the rights to. So that person might not be even aware that you uh, transfer something to them. Later in time, they may notice that they receive something by using their public private key, they can claim that uh, Bitcoin or whatever blockchain you are using. So here, when I say it involves one or more users, by the more, I'm not talking about the person you are transferring the rights to. Actually, I'm talking about the person or persons who are digitally signing the transaction. If it is a multi-signature process, then there will be more than one person who is signing it, right? So it doesn't matter who or whom you are transferring the money to, but we are interested in which people got together and signed that transaction, okay? Blockchains are distributed digital ledgers of cryptographically signed transactions that are grouped into blocks. Each block is cryptographically linked to the previous one, making it tamper evident after validation and undergoing a consensus decision. So whenever you actually publish a block, all of the full nodes in the network, uh, check the consensus model and see if it is valid or not. So it's actually, goes a validation process. Actually, that validation includes uh, 
checking the validity of every transaction that you included in the block and so on and so forth. As new blocks are added, older blocks become more difficult to modify, creating tamper resistance. So this is actually some people uh, see it like a Lego. Uh, whenever you create a new block, actually you are putting a Lego on top of your tower of Lego. So since you are putting more onto the top, it becomes very hard to modify something at the bottom because you have to destroy everything from that Lego piece. So this is why it is tamper resistance, okay? New blocks are replicated across copies of the ledger within the network and any conflicts are resolved automatically using established rules. So here actually we will talk more about when we talk about mining, but maybe uh, at the same time, two different but valid blocks may be announced to the network. So some part of the network might think that the block they heard first is the correct one, and some remaining part of the network think that the other one is correct. So in those scenarios, uh, these conflicts are resolved automatically, generally by waiting and seeing which uh, blockchain becomes the longer one. So actually this, this is done by the software itself. So most of the time users do not worry about it. Let's look at the Bitcoin in this sense. In Bitcoin, the blockchain enabled users to be pseudonymous. This means that, actually next sentence will explain it in a more clear way. This means that users are anonymous, but their account identifiers are not. Additionally, all transactions are publicly visible. So next week we will see that, but you, you can uh, have a copy of the blockchain yourself or use a, one of the famous web pages and just check uh, what happened in each block or you can simply search for a, a Bitcoin address and see how much money is transferred to it and how, many, how much it's uh, received and how much it's sent and so on. So everything is public all of the account numbers and every transaction, but we don't know whom these account numbers belong to. So this is where the pseudonymous uh, idea comes from. So once you, you know, publicly make your, uh, uh, once you publicly announce your identity, for instance, by tweeting that some account belongs to you, actually the pseudonymity is lost. So everybody now knows that you made all of those transactions and so on. So this has effectively enabled Bitcoin to offer pseudo-anonymity because accounts can be created without any identification or authorization process. Such processes are typically required by uh, know your customer laws. So actually I want to talk a little bit more about this topic. So uh, generally you can actually create a Bitcoin wallet without, uh, you know, providing your identification, like, you know, uh, sending a photo of your ID or anything, simply by using a software, you can create a Bitcoin wallet, a Bitcoin address, and somebody can transfer Bitcoin to you, and you can transfer it to some place, somebody else, and, you know, use it. During all of this process, your pseudo anonymity is still valid, right? But if you use web pages like, uh, cryptocurrency exchange web pages when you create an account there in the past you can do it still uh, pseudo anonym way because generally what they did was to ask what was your name and you know you can easily give a false uh, data to them and people did this in years ago but a few years ago due to know your customer laws all of these web pages are forced to uh, know their customers so maybe since 2012 or 15, whenever you create an account from a crypt cryptocurrency exchange web page, you have to prove your identity. And most of the time, since these web pages work e internationally, what they do is to you know, uh, send them a photocopy or a photo of your ID card, but you also you know, keep that ID next to your face and take a selfie to prove that it really belongs to you. So, uh, so far this was the case, but still, as you can see, I can 
I have to do this. I have to lose pseudonymity when I use a crypto exchange web page. But uh, if I don't use such a crypto exchange web page, you know, I, I can keep my pseudonymity, right? I can simply go to uh, a wallet software and create a wallet and, you know, transfer Bitcoins to each other. But very recently, European in Union passed a law saying that those wallet software should also know their customers as it is mentioned in the know your customer law. So this is very uh, hard thing to explain to lawmakers and also the users, but maybe you are familiar with, for instance, MetaMask, which is a, a wallet software that uses Ethereum uh, blockchain. So due to the idea behind the Web3, you know, now you can just create a, uh, account using the MetaMask, you know, connect to web pages, buy NFTs and sell NFTs, you know, transfer Ethereum and so on. So these softwares allow you to do that and you, you could do it in a pseudonymous way, right? And uh, this is somewhat uh, the part of Web3 because uh, recall that in the last five or 10 years, whenever you wanted to create an account to a web page, you know, the, you can create it in a usual way, or sometimes there is a button saying that connect with your Facebook account, which is very convenient. You know, you just, just press a button and log in. Now you can say that connect your wallet. So when you press that, uh, since your actually MetaMask account contains a public key, this actually allows you to sign transactions. So this way you actually can log into, you know, NFT. Uh, marketplaces and you know buy nfts and so on, do whatever you want or you can uh, log into a twitter variant of a social media and so on but now european union law says that uh, applications like metamask has to collect user information so this is really bizarre what i understand from those laws you have to again you know provide your id or maybe take a selfie with your id next to your face whenever you create a MetaMask account, if you're a European Union citizen. So we will see very strange uh, use cases in the future. I don't know how they will solve this, but if they do what I say right now, saying, you know, taking a selfie and that kind of things, if they force this kind of stuff, then maybe the dream of Web3 might end earlier than we expected, okay? So we have to wait how European Union will deal with this. But uh, also at the other end, I, other hand, I understand why they are doing this because, you know, you can uh, do money laundering without, you know, uh, providing your ID. So this is why they're actually passing this kind of laws. All right. Since Bitcoin was pseudonymous, it was essential to have mechanisms to create trust in an environment where users could not be easily identified. So this is very important. You are using a software with a lot of people in the network, but uh, somehow you don't trust them. So this is actually sometimes misunderstood. So uh, this is also, uh, uh, for me, it also appears to me like a real life simulation because this is also how I feel when I uh, leave my house or when I, drive my car in the traffic because I don't trust anybody else in the system, but I also know that it works somehow, right? So this is why I also see cryptocurrencies as a real life simulation. All right, so if you don't trust anybody, uh, how it works? Without trusted intermediaries, the needed trust within a blockchain network is enabled by four key characteristics. One of them is the ledger technology. So if you want to think it in Turkish, it is actually Maliye Defter, right? You're actually writing every financial you know, transaction there. So the technology uses an append on the ledger to provide full transactional history. Unlike traditional databases, transactions and values in a blockchain are not overridden. So this is the important part. So uh, for instance, whenever you log into your bank account, you see your current balance, which is always less than what you imagine, but still you see some number there. And whenever you receive money, it is increased, or if, if you send money, it is decreased. So it is overridden, 
at, in a blockchain or in cryptocurrencies, we don't modify it. We write every transaction to the blockchain. So at one point you receive two Bitcoins, let's say, and maybe one month later you receive three Bitcoins and that's it in the blockchain. When you look at it, you see that at some, play, at some point you receive two Bitcoins and at some point you receive three Bitcoins. The wallet software looks all of them and tells you that you have five Bitcoins, but actually those are stay there in two different transactions. So if you want to spend, uh, for instance, two Bitcoins, you have to only use one of them. But if you want to use like four Bitcoins, you have to spend all of these two transactions and maybe send the remaining part to yourself, which we will talk more about when we talk about Bitcoin. Second characteristic is the security. Blockchains are cryptographically secure, ensuring that the data has not been tampered with and that the data is attestable. So this actually also uh, summarizes all of the misconceptions I mentioned before, because once you say that blockchains are cryptographically secure, everybody thinks that everything is encrypted. This is where the security lies. But actually the next sentence explains where cryptography is used. Ensuring that the data has not been tampered with is actually, we, here we are talking about integrity, which is provided by cryptographic hash functions. And that the data is attestable means that only the person who has the authority or the ownership of something can you know, sign it and transfer the ownership to somebody else, which is done by digital signatures. Okay, so the third characteristic is the sharedness. Uh the ledger is shared amongst multiple participants. This provides transparency. This is also important because once we keep the ledger in a bank, the bank does not share it with everybody else. So you don't know who has what amount of money in a bank, right? But once we, we do it in the blockchain technology, everything is transparent. Everybody knows what is happening in the ledger. And finally, it is distributed. The blockchain can be distributed. This allows for scaling the number of nodes of a blockchain network to make it more resilient to attacks by bad actors. So the, the more the merrier, in short. So these four characteristics actually somehow provide trust altogether. So let's go back to blockchain categorization. Blockchain network can be categorized based on their permission model, which determines who can maintain them. For example, publishing blogs. If anyone can publish a new blog, it is permissionless. This is what happens in cryptocurrency. So by doing some mining, you can publish a new blog. But if only particular users can publish blogs, we call it it's, that it is a permissioned uh, blockchain. So in the permissionless case, you can think about cryptocurrencies. These networks are open to all to participate. This is why there isn't any encryption here because it is publicly available to anybody. So there's no point in encrypting the Bitcoin blockchain because we are publicly giving it to anybody. To prevent malicious users, a consensus system requires users to expand or maintain resources when attempting to publish blogs and reverse them. So this is the main idea since it is publicly available to everybody, anybody can participate. So we want to prevent malicious users. So our consensus model actually uh, solves this problem, which we will talk more about when we talk about consensus models. So the second one was the permission case. Permission blockchain networks are ones where users publishing blocks must be authorized by some authority. So I think about a blockchain created by the, for instance, European Union, member countries. So they would only give permission to the member states to publish new books. So in this case, the European Union will be the authority who provides this permission. Since only authorized users are maintaining the blockchain, it is possible to restrict read access and to restrict who can issue transactions. So this way, maybe you can now talk about encryption because since only the interested party can read it, maybe you can encrypt the whole blockchain or maybe provide some different read access to them. And also uh, you can choose who can, you know, issue transactions and so on. So permission case is somewhat different. And uh, most people always think about permission in this case. So this is what, what was also was hard to explain to people because when Bitcoin became very famous around 2015, 
almost every country uh, officials started to say that we will create our own Bitcoin. So again, some people consulted me, asking me how they can create a, their own cryptocurrency. And I asked them why they want to do such a thing, because currently their financial systems are already digital. So there should be a reason for you to create your own country's cryptocurrency. But they were trying to explain to me that they want the exact copy of Bitcoin, but the ownership will be theirs. So I said then to that, then you need to move to a permission blockchain. But once you move to a permission blockchain, it will not be the same as the Bitcoin. So this was very hard for them to understand. So they said that they will create their own Bitcoin. But since 2015, I haven't heard any such uh, cryptocurrency created by them. So uh, you have to understand what you want to do. If you want to create a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and make it permissionless, where everybody can mine and uh, you know, create, uh, earn uh, Bitcoins, then it should have to be permissionless, but then it will not belong to you. So if you want something where you have the authority, you have to make it a permissioned blockchain. So actually you can create such cryptocurrencies, like some, there are some stable coins where countries are uh, trying to build for themselves. So they are trying to fix its price to their current currency. For instance, think about a stable coin created by Turkish government. So there any coin will be equal to one Turkish lira. But if for some reason people get more interested by, for, in buying this stable coin, it price, its price might increase more than one Turkish lira. For instance, let's say that it became 1.1 Turkish lira. At that point, the authority has to provide or supply more stable coins into the system to create an inflation so that its price reduces to one uh, Turkish lira again. So the opposite can also happen. So maybe it loses some value, so it becomes 0 0.9 Turkish lira. And at that point, you have to create deflation. So you actually burn some of your currency so that it, its price increases. So for this reason, this stable coin type of cryptocurrencies allow you to burn coins. Actually, you can also burn your crypto, uh, Bitcoin, but this is due to the uh, thing that allows you by the, uh, actually this comes from the secret language of the Bitcoin because you can create such a transaction where you start to transfer some money, but you know, finish the transaction by returning true so that that's, you can destroy that money completely. Nobody can withdraw it. So there are ways of burning Bitcoin, but uh, this was not actually intentional. It is just a way of creating a transaction.